All right, note to Hillary Clinton and reshuffling that deck. That deck's a lot bigger than you thought. And believe it or not, your old boss has made it even worse. Welcome, everybody. I'm Neil Cavuto. And it's not just America. It's the world. The gap between the rich and the poor has widened everywhere. According to a report out of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, this damning little nugget, the gap between what the 10% are making and the bottom 10% are making, is the widest it's been since the 1980s, not only in this country, pretty much all developed countries. On average, the richest 10% are now making about 10 times more than the bottom 10%, and that gap is still growing, even as taxes on the upper income tax worldwide, well, they've been skyrocketing. So maybe raising taxes isn't the answer, but what is? Or is this now so out of control and so many nations so heavily in debt, it's already too late to stop the social train wreck that no less than David Stockman sees coming. Like I said, we haven't seen these extremes since the Reagan years. And wouldn't you know, David was Ronald Reagan's budget guy during many of those years. He warned the Gipper famously about a lot of this stuff and got taken to the woodshed for it. Now Stockman fears we're all about to be taken to the woodshed because politicians in both parties, in fact, globally all parties, have refused to do anything about it. David, now the chickens, I guess, are coming home to roost. What do you make of this? That may be uh, true, and the data you cite is correct, but not for the reason that people think. This huge disparity is not because of some flaw in capitalism or because of the Reagan tax cuts 35 years ago that have been lost in the mist of history anyway, right. or even the greed of Wall Street. The problem is central banks that are out of control, printing money like no one ever imagined, and have created a massive worldwide financial inflation. And when you have a financial inflation, the people that own the stocks and the bonds get the windfalls. So, so it, it got disproportionately out of whack in the last seven or eight years, actually right post the meltdown. Right. When you would think things would even up a little bit, anything but. But it's gotten worse, actually. We have such a recency bias in the news and in the financial markets that people forget what happened a decade or three decades ago. Let me give some context. In 1980, when we started with Reagan, the GDP was three trillion. The total value of equity at market and at debt in the U.S. economy was seven trillion, about two to one. Right. Today, the GDP is 17 trillion, but the total value of equity and debt is 92 trillion dollars. In other words, Instead of two to one financial value to income, let's say, or output, it is now, uh, you know, 92 to 17, five to one. So why and is that a bad thing? Because those are not sustainable real values. Those are simply bond uh, prices that have been uh, inflated because the Fed and the other central banks have bought so many bonds. They've driven up the price, driven the yields down to really absurd low levels. You might recall, your uh, viewers would, a few weeks ago in Germany, the 10-year bond was five <coughs> basis points. Now, who in their right mind in any world that I can think of wants to own the debt, even of Germany, for five basis Apparently points? Apparently people but, do. <laughs> no, they Apparently don't. Apparently people do. No, they don't. So no. who's buying that? The Just ECB. those central banks? No, Mario Drag Draghi. Okay, right. the central banks of the world have taken their balance sheet. And when they expand their balance sheet, they're buying bonds, they're I buying understood. stuff. From six so trillion, they're keeping this artificial This gap. is totally artificial. So how is it screwing guys in the bottom? It's screwing guys in the bottom uh, because it is not helping the economy to grow. It is actually diverting or siphoning financial resources into pure gambling in, in the financial markets. And it's creating vast windfalls for the 10% at the top. Remember, the 10% at the top own 85% of the financial assets in the country. But so what's interesting, it's been during Republican and Democratic administrations. So is this beyond their control or are the have central banks taken over? And that's what's The right. central banks have taken over. I call it almost a coup d'etat, okay? Unconstitutional, extra constitutional domination of the entire you, economy. You know the argument those central bankers raise, whether you talk to Alan Greenspan or Ben Bernanke, you know, if they didn't do what they did, particularly Ben Bernanke, uh, that 
it, we'd be in a lot deeper hole. What do you say? Ben Bernanke is one of the most destructive men that have ever held high office in you the United States. You should hear what he says about you. <laughs> no, but it's true. He, uh, he is a uh, kind of unreconstructed Keynesian who believes that he can sit at the dials of the Federal Reserve and by manipulating interest rates and financial markets and the yield curve manage the entire 17 well, trillion US economy. Well, he says US that he economy. did. He says the proof is in the pudding because we skirted a, a depression, things stabilized, and you should be thanking him, not hitting him. Well, of course he says that because you can't prove otherwise. But the fact is, uh, we this economy recovered not because of what Ben Bernanke did or what Obama did. This economy recovered slightly, moderately, tepidly, because in capitalism, when you have a big liquidation of debt and excess, uh, you know, investment in production, uh, then you bounce back. Yeah, and but, but to your point, now not everyone has bounced back. I want to show you something because this is a map that shows 32 states with budget caps still facing their own fiscal crisis. Now, that means they've got to either raise taxes, cut spending, do both. But uh, that, that's well into a supposed recovery. That's not good. What no, and that's uh, just uh, symptomatic of the general problem. In other words, the states are suffering from lack of economic growth and real Main Street job and income creation, so their revenue has been held back. Right. Secondly, they have a huge entitlement problem called unfunded pensions of state uh, and local employees. And the problem with a lot of states is they, they have to address this on the year. In other words, They're they being can't forced skirt through, to right? fund, but they have used various gimmicks and phony accounting to underfund their uh, pensions for years, if not decades. Now uh, the uh, chickens are coming home to roost, and uh, they're, therefore they're suffering uh, these huge fiscal problems. But it's only indicative of what's happening at the federal level, too. We haven't solved the deficit. We have simply kicked the can for a couple so of when, years. So when Barack Obama says that as a percentage of GDP, the deficit's coming down, he has taken claims to other things that, that thanks to him, things are, are turning around. I want your reaction to this, the president yeah. taking about. Listen to this. It is indisputable that our economy is stronger today than when I took office. By every economic measure, we are better off now than we were when I took office. That's been a consistent theme of his. What do you think? Okay, well, he took office at the bottom of the deepest recession since World War II. You can't uh, cherry pick the data. You have to look at the trend in the context. The truth is the unemployment rate today would be 10% if we still had the same labor force participation rate that was in place when he took office. The truth is if we look at the seven years from the pre-crisis peak to the present, we've created three million jobs only compared to six million in the previous seven year recovery cycle and 12 million in the one of the 1990s. So the only thing, what we've got to do in order to correct a lot of the problems, you yeah. see, we'd have to have a big growth spurt and it would have to last a while. Barring that, what do we do? Uh, barring that, I think we have to start by recognizing, one, we can't print our way to prosperity. We need a house cleaning with the Fed. We need to get their foot off the neck of the market. Let they argue rates would go skyrocketing. They should. That. They rates should, should go. Up. Rates should go to where supply and demand. Where do you think that is? Uh, who knows what it is? Well, short what, rates are but that's at zero percent. Yes. Okay. And it would be substantially higher Three, than zero. Three, four, five percent. Easy. Okay. Easy. And the point is. You imagine what that would be to our debt. Uh, that would finally wake up Washington and force it to face the real fiscal issues. That would wake up the corporations of America who are borrowing money hand over fist to buy back their stock in order to goose their stock prices and their executive options, but yeah. that's not helping long-term value creation and growth. So everywhere, misleading, distorting signals are being given to both public and private sector players about financial values. The prices have been falsified by the Fed. So if the Federal Reserve is now hinting, as you know, that, 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 that rates will go up, but maybe not as soon as we think, certainly not in June, maybe not September, maybe not this year, what are they putting off for you? What are they putting off? Uh, they are basically petrified that Wall Street will have a hissy fit because they've been fueling 
so much. Uh, you zero say let the hissy fit in. You have to let it happen. Right. What is capitalism about? It's about markets. It's about supply and demand. It's and about not propped up. Markets. It's about millions of people deciding what a stock is worth. What a so yield. David Stockman <laughs> would welcome, not that you personally welcome, but it would be the pain from which we would gain. We, we, it would be abrupt. It would be tough. But we'd be better for it without the government or the Fed or anyone else interfering with these free markets. Absolutely. And that, that's why we believe in capitalism. But would a David we, Stockman let a Bank of America or Absolutely. I would, go I would have let Goldman go under. I would have let Morgan Stanley go under. I would have had the FIDIC resolve Bank of America. In other words, right. take the bank and take the hit. They had guaranteed the deposits. But all the holding company investments that they had made and all of the... Uh, so the argument uh, that that would... Uh, Freeze capital worldwide, you say? Uh, who knows what it would do? We're, it, we're in so deep. Yeah. We've created such the 92 trillion I talked about of stock and bond value is not real sustainable value. And if we're going to continue, well, there are a lot of market pros. I have to say this market is still undervalued. Okay, you well, I mean, you know, the the, the market is. Uh, I mean, it's a joke. Yeah. Okay, it's a joke. And these are people that are trading by the hour and the minute. There is no sense of what real value so, so is. So let me ask you, I wish I would turn, but I always love picking your incredible yeah. brain. If Ronald Reagan were to come back and he were to talk to you today, and he knew the deficits that you warned about, so that, that was a problem then, do you think he would have said, I, I, I should have reined it back a little bit, I should have looked at the math a little more, um, that the revenue I was getting from these tax cuts, generous as it was, I, I didn't appreciate the degree to which even my own party would spend that money and then some. What do you think he would tell you? Well, I think he would be mortified, but not just by the deficit, but by the fact that he appointed uh, Alan Greenspan to the Fed because he thought he was a conservative, hard money, uh, prudent, uh, you know, finance guy. And he, he appointed turned out, him right before the 87 market yes, crash. It, but he turned yeah. out to be the biggest money printer, central bank uh, monetary planner. So you think he'd have regrets? He would have tremendous regrets. He would feel betrayed by what Greenspan did. And once the Fed started down that route of monetizing the public debt, then Congress lost control entirely. Because, and now it's a global contagion. Well, look, you have, we have uh, nearly 19 trillion of debt, and the average yeah. interest rate is under 2%. Yeah. So the people in Washington think, uh, we'll get to this tomorrow. It doesn't cost anything. And when you tell politicians that debt doesn't cost anything, you are, <laughs> you know, sowing the whirlwind of uh, a tremendous crisis somewhere down the road. David Stockman? All right, you folks at home, you may agree or disagree, but he does make you think. And we have been having a heck of a party. All parties end. I do know that. I wake up the next morning and discover the hard way, but they do end. All right, well.